Hello everyone and welcome to Central Baptist Church. It is time for Sunday afternoon service. Would you stand with me please and turn in your songbooks to song number 375. Song number 375, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul, for which long I have sought, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy, oh my soul, like a sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering going astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many are washed all away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Joy, oh my soul, like a sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, there's a light in the valley of death now for me. Since Jesus came into my heart, and the gates of the city and I can see. Since Jesus came into my heart, since. Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart. Tons of joy, oh my soul, like a sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. On the floor, I shall go, there will dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. I'm happy, so happy, where'd I go since Jesus came into my heart? Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, like a sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Amen. Are you happy? Yes, sir. Amen. You're on your way to that city. Amen. 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 You know, he's not just waving his arms for nothing. you got to pay attention when he holds. So we're paying him big money for this. All right. Well, it's a good thing to be here tonight. And uh, Amen. Let's, let's get the Lord in on this. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you now for tonight. And Lord, we're happy. We are happy. We're happy that we're on our way. Lord, we're looking forward to you coming back and, and then just all going back together. Lord, we're looking forward to all of eternity in that city with you forever and ever. Lord, tonight we pray that you might bless this service. Lord, we pray that you might 
meet with us. Lord, we pray that you might speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray that you might do a wonderful work. And then, Lord, again, we ask for wisdom tonight. Lord, we pray that you might give us wisdom for the future. And, Lord, we pray that in all things that we say and do, that you might get the glory and the honor and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have our chorus, Psalm 59, 16, and 17. If it's not in your bulletins, it should be in your Bibles. Psalm number 59, 16, and 17. Okay, then I'm just going to play it. Yeah. Daniel can lead it. song leader all right good job well we do have some announcements tonight aren't you glad to be here this is a much better place to be than like they say the best jail in town all right yeah well there are some pretty nice jails out there uh, maybe you can testify about that brother tell us all about it <laughs> Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, you know, it's good to be with God's people tonight. And uh, we're glad to be in church. Uh, obviously, the next thing on the agenda is Thursday night Bible study and prayer. That's coming up this week. You guys are way off into the future. But uh, we want you to be here. We want to encourage you to be here. Uh, Brother, Brother Marshall will be preaching for us on Thursday. Then, of course, we have our regular Saturday events. Uh, we have a visitation. We have men's prayer at 8 o'clock. And then, of course, we'll have uh, uh, church next week. And then uh, I can't say anything greater than what was said this morning about the Ladies Balboa Island Fellowship. I mean, I'm so excited that I, I might have to put a wig on and just go for myself. Wouldn't you like to see that? No, I wouldn't like to see that either. Uh, but uh, that'll be a great event. Ladies, I encourage you to go. And if you have, do we bring guests to that? It would be a great event to bring some other guests and, and, uh, and be able to fellowship with them for that. And then, of course, next Sunday night, we're going to have our wonderful Watermelon Fellowship. We're still debating on the, uh, you guys are in the wrong seat. Get back over there where you belong. Uh, we're still debating on whether we should have our the seed spitting contest. Are any of you any of you guys have you practiced spitting watermelon seeds? Okay, we got a couple ladies. My wife tries to do it and it just goes like this. It just falls off her chin. 
So ladies are not, we're not gonna invite the ladies for that, it'll be a guy thing. I'm not sure if we're gonna even do that or not, but we are gonna have a good time. Uh, guaranteed, delicious, refreshing watermelon, it'll be a good time of fellowship. And then of course, uh, be in prayer. It's not too soon to pray for the missions conference. We've got some great uh, missionaries coming in. We've had them before. Obviously, we support them. And, and missions is a big part of, of what we do. Yeah. It's our way to reach the world and uh, support them financially. So, so be much in prayer for that. Amen. All right, we have our memory verse, Proverbs 2, 3 through 5. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, if thou seekest and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the Proverbs 2, 3 through 5. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for his treasure, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Amen. Would you stand with me? For our last song is 846, Little is Much When God is in it. Song number 846, would you stand with me please? In the harvest in our band, there's a word. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown that you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and you'll not forget his own. Little is much God is in it. Labor not for wealth and fame. There's a crown and you can win it If you'll go in Jesus' name Are you playing a side of service? Are you born for toil and care? You can still be in the battle In the sacred place of prayer Little is much when God is in it Labor not for fame or fame There's a crown pray for the offering tonight. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for um, who you are and what you do for us and 
what you are for us, Lord. Uh, I pray that we would uh, please you um, with our giving, Lord. Um, so we just give it to you. We ask that you would bless it, Lord. We ask, Father God, that you would maybe even multiply it and use it for your purpose, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated.
praise the Lord. Thank you for that special very much this evening. That's an that's a easy song to sing, uh, but it is harder to live, is it not? Hear my Lord, send me. I will follow you anywhere. And that, uh, that's hard. That's hard. You study the history of, of the believers, the disciples. You study the history of, of believers that are not in the Word of God. And some of them have given their lives to follow the Lord anywhere. And uh, thank God for those examples. Amen. They go before us to encourage us. Well, it is good to be here tonight. I, my, my son and I were privileged to go with it was Brother Scott, right? Yeah. Brother Scott Maxwell and Serene we went to lunch today. And I think we might be the last patrons of Morton's. Uh, is it Morton's? Walton's, excuse me. Yeah, that, that would help if I get the right name. But Walton's, they said they're closing it down. Oh, Watson. Watson. Watson's. 1899, they opened it up. And they're saying they're closing it down. I say, I say CNN. Fake news. I think we should go over there tonight, all of us, and get them back in business. What do you say? So they brought this uh, Rocky Road Sunday for my son, and it was, it was like pouring over the top. And he had about four or five napkins to clean it up, and we were trying to get down that thing before it fell everywhere, but uh, that's, a, that's, a good, that's good eats right there. They can't let that go down. That's right. That's this wrong, so I don't know what we need to do about that, but um, I believe every one of you are called to go help place, put that place back in business, make sure they don't close down. <laughs> Tonight, I had a, I had a um, buffalo chicken sandwich. Serene and I got one of those, and, and uh, wow. Uh, I think it was a whole buffalo on the sandwich. <laughs> Trying to get that thing in my mouth without getting on my tie, was, uh, that was a feat in itself. But thank you for the fellowship, and a good, good talking to them today, and fellowshipping with them. I'm glad you're back here tonight. You knew I was going to be here, and you came back. And I appreciate you being here in God's house. Uh, man, I've gone back and forth today about which sermon God wants me to bring, and uh, we're going to do something that's just different. It's a different lesson, and I'm going to tell you about it here in a minute, but I'm going to set it aside for a second, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of my testimony, if, if you would uh, indulge me. Um, I thank the Lord for the grace and mercy that He has shown me in my life. Uh, I have a very unique life that I've lived, uh, blessed of the Lord. I was born in Winter Haven, Florida, and uh, that's right smack dab in the middle. That's because that's where my family stopped in order for me to be born. Now, that may seem weird to you, but uh, what happened in my life was in 1976, my dad and my mother uh, were called into evangelism, and uh, they got into a bus and another vehicle and took off. My dad was uh, privileged to be led by the Lord, uh, to the Lord by Dallas Billington at Akron Baptist Temple in the fall of 1953 in Dallas Billington's office, and uh, it's a, quite a history there. I think I maybe said this to you last time I was here, and my wife's uh, grandparents, or uh, was, well, my, my, grandma, my wife's grandmother was led to the Lord by J. Frank Norris there in Michigan, and so it's such a blessing and it's such a history. I, uh, so my dad got saved in uh, the fall of 1953 at Akron Baptist Temple and met my mom in New York City. Uh, my dad was from West Virginia, mom was from New York City. They put those two people together and what a time. Um, those two different cultures put together, it, it was pretty wild. Uh, my, my mom grew up on classical music, my dad grew up on mountain music and uh, all mountain food and mom was the city girl, right? But I think they actually changed at some point. Mom became more of the mountain girl, barefoot and all of that. But uh, they, when they came together, they, they blended their music. And Dad said they started something called classical grass. And uh, it just, it's a blessing. 1976, my dad took off with, uh, let's see, my brother was not born yet. So it was six girls at the time in a bus. And another man that, that was kind of, uh, my dad was ministering to at the time, he jumped in on a vehicle and they took off and went into evangelism. My dad has been an evangelist till this day. He is now 89 years old 
and just preached for a youth camp a couple weeks ago. And my mom is 83 years old and still a soul wedding machine, uh, witnessing to, to everything that moves and things that don't move. She witnesses to everybody. <laughs> you know, she, she has an incredible way of, of connecting with people and uh, th- thank the Lord for it. So uh, I was born on the road because we were stopped there. This is a true story. Don't look at me that way. This is what happened. This is what happened. I, uh, that's, that's where I was. Five days old, I went to uh, Landmark Baptist Church in Haines City, Florida. Uh, ladies, I hear that you're not supposed to take your children to church that soon, but mom hadn't heard about that yet. And so she took us to church, and there I was, five days old in church, and uh, grew up in church. I'm very privileged to do so. At uh, probably three years old, my dad put a banjo in my hand and said, strum. (laughs) And so uh, all of my siblings, now there was uh, more of us born, so I'll tell you about that. I have eight sisters and one brother. So there's 10 kids total, eight girls, two boys. A lot, and all on the bus. At one time we had a, um, we had two dachshunds. We had a, a, a turtle and five flying squirrels. I'm not making this up. I, you can't make this stuff up. My dad, we were up at this cabin up, up in Pennsylvania. He thought, he thought he heard mice in the cabin. And so he got this live trap. He trapped it. Come to find out, he trapped flying squirrels. He caught five of them that week. And they had to travel with the Marshall family, of course. And we found out that it could be fined like $5,000 a piece if they find out. <laughs> We didn't know this. But that's just the kind of life I live. It's a little bit strange, okay? Uh, I've been to, by God's grace, every state in the United States, including Hawaii and Alaska. And uh, we've been to, oh, I don't know, maybe 1,500 independent Baptist churches throughout the years. And traveling, singing, doing all kinds of things. Uh, Our family did dramas. And um, my dad almost hooked up with Lester Roloff at one time and, and did ministry together. And they just had, he, it's just been around a long time. And so um, it's just a blessing what God did in my life. I grew up, like I said, on the road, involved in music right away, uh, banjo. Everyone in my family had to play at least two instruments, uh, according to my father. And so everyone learned uh, two instruments. Every one of my sisters plays the piano because dad believed every girl should learn to play the piano. And uh, so it's just a singing road show, okay? That's what we were. My dad used to say, well, we, we came through the back door because churches didn't know who we were, so they had us come in and sing for junior churches and for VBS and stuff like that. And so no one knew who we were uh, back in the day. I remember being down here at Lighthouse Baptist Church when I was about eight years old here in San Diego and uh, the old property and the stuff that we, they had us involved in, sing here, preach here, <laughs> Do a puppet show over here, and just <laughs> so uh, I'm not. I really, I'm not exaggerating. It was it was a crazy and fun um, life. But uh, the problem with growing up in a Christian home is that you hear the gospel all the time, and you grow up around it, and you're very familiar with it. And thank God for that. I, I believe you either grow up with a lot of law, or you grow up with a lot of sin. Okay, so you have either a lot of sin in your life and you have to come to grips with the law of God and the grace of God, or you grew up in a home with a lot of law and you had to come to grips with the grace of God. And in my home, there was a lot of law. I, I got a lot of thou shalt nots. And it's easy at times to think that you're okay because you grow up in a Christian home. And so it, it was when I was 11 years old, uh, my brother actually had, had uh, just... Uh, gotten saved a few months before that, and when he did, he began to work on my heart about, are you sure that you're going to go to heaven when you leave this world? Have you made a profession of faith that's true yourself? And so the Lord began to work on me um, throughout that year. That was of 1991, when I was 11. And uh, that witnessing mom I told you about, she would always just put things in and witness. She was on you. She would give you the gospel and use the gospel at any time. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time we were, I had, I had some sort of attitude issue. I don't remember what it was, but something. You know how you get 11, 12 years old? You start to kind of kick against the pricks, right? And 
um, my mom said, Matt, are you sure you're saved? And that thought just hit me at 11 years old. Well, sure, you know, sure I am. And uh, God began to work on me. We were in uh, southern Ohio that year, that spring, and we were staying in Kentucky. Went home that night on Sunday night and began to think about that. I laid awake at night and thought about the Lord's return and being left behind. And the Holy Spirit began to work on me that night. We stayed, I stayed in what's called like a bread van. You know what I'm talking about, like a UPS truck van? Those kind of vans, that's what we had. It's just, that's where I slept. Uh, my brother and I. And uh, so my brother was older than I. He could stay up one hour later than I could. I had to go to bed an hour early. So I went, I went to bed that night, laying there in bed. I began to think, do you know for sure that if the Lord was to return, that you would go to be with him? And I remember my brother came in at his time to go to bed. We had to go to bed at 10. He went to bed at 11. And he came in there at 10. And I started talking to my brother about that. He said, well, you ought to, you ought to go talk to, to mom or dad. So I said, well, you go, go get mom for me, will you? And so he did. He went and got my, my mom. She came in. I told her a little bit. She said, let me get your dad. <laughs> and uh, dad comes in and took the Bible. He gave me a simple gospel message from John 3.16. In fact, it was the same passage of Scripture that... Brother Dallas Billington showed him in 1953. And he said, I'll never forget when Brother Billington said, the Bible says here that it's for, whoso, for, for whosoever, you can put your name there. He said, for if Marshall believeth on him, he shall not perish but have everlasting life. He said, put your name in that verse. And he gave me the gospel message. And I'll never forget as an 11-year-old young man, uh, by faith, seeing Christ die for me, not not for others in the family, but for me. And I asked Christ to save me that night, April 29th, 1991. And I thank the Lord. got baptized a few months after that, just a few weeks after that. And uh, thank the Lord. And I started a journey with the Lord. That next summer was my first official youth camp. Now, you could go to youth camp as a kid, but it's not until you're a teenager that you're really going to youth camp. Am I right? Now you're really involved. And I was the first year of Camp Berean in northern Illinois, Rockford, Illinois. Pastor Mark Swanson started a youth camp that he's been running for over 30 years. And our family was kind of the, the founding uh, evangelist family for that camp. And he had us come so many years. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Brother Buddy Blunkall before. Uh, he's a preacher, singer, been gone home to be with Jesus. And we used to do a lot of camps together. Uh, never had the Rogers come with us there, but uh, kind of same, same kind of family. And uh, that, that first year, 1992, uh, the Lord worked on me on, on July, I believe it was July 13th, uh, to surrender to preach. And I don't forget, I was sitting some second row uh, at camp, Camp Berean. And the Lord uh, worked on my heart and, con and convicted me to, to surrender to preach. I went for it that night knelt down and asked the Lord, I'll go in the ministry if you want me to. And the Lord asked me to go in the ministry and called me. And I thank the Lord for that. That was 30 years ago this month uh, that the Lord called me to preach. Stayed on the road with my family and uh, began to be involved. I remember that very fall. I was 12 years old and I started preaching at, uh, at a high school and high school graduate, or excuse me, a high school chapel service and preached to them. That's a very hard group of people to preach to. They don't like it. They don't want to be there. This is at a Christian school chapel service, and most of them were asleep. But I preached at 12 years old for the first time, and uh, probably they fell asleep because I was so bad. But uh, that's a nerve-wracking place to preach. And uh, thank the Lord, though, uh, for the opportunity to do so. And I just over the years had more chances to be in ministry and uh, involved with that, doing music, uh, used those, those musical abilities the Lord has given me. Our family has probably made about 25 albums over the years, something like that, and uh, just all the way back from LP days, the 45s. Are you, are you tracking with me, 45s? No? Nobody knows what I just said, the 45s? Okay, 45 records. Uh, my, my family made two of those back in the late 70s, and um, that was a classic era there, wasn't it? But uh, it, it's, it was pretty neat. So very heavily involved in music, but uh, the Lord called me to preach. So when I graduated from high school, I, I started to take a correspondence course. Uh, I was already involved in ministry, traveling, driving. Uh, we drove a bus as big as the, as the Greyhound bus. 
And uh, so I drove that, involved in ministry and, and preaching, singing, but uh, did correspondence in college, but it just was taking me a long time to finish as, as it can be on the road. It'll be a little bit, it's a little bit tedious to try to do a correspondence course and move. And we, we never stayed in a place more than really one week, uh, maybe two weeks at, at the max. Uh, the best way, I think, for our church here to understand what I'm talking about is the Mark Rogers family, uh, just with a lot of girls, a lot of, a lot of dresses, a lot of hairspray and stuff. And so that's kind of was, was my whole life. If, if we were here on this platform, we would, actually wouldn't be able to fit on this platform. <laughs> there, was just, there was just stringed instruments and brass instruments and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, when I graduated from high school, I took correspondence for a while and realized I was not going to probably really finish it soon if I stayed full time on the road. And so I made a step of faith. I was actually in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we were there singing, ministering, and I decided I was going to go to Central Florida and finish up my Bible college there at Landmark Baptist College. And God uh, used those years in, in the ministry there. Got to work at a radio station, a Christian radio station there. Boy, was that a time. Uh, so I got there, and within two or three weeks, they had me on a one-hour children's program every day. A one-hour children's program. I was, I was standing on my head, basically, by the end of it, trying to entertain kids on the radio. But man, what a fun experience that was, Christian radio and, um, and playing instruments and doing voices and, oh, man, crazy stuff. But I got to work in youth ministry there, and I thank the Lord for that. After I graduated from college, I um, went up to a church in uh, northern Illinois at the Bible Baptist Church in Mount Prospect, Mount Prospect Illinois. I worked at that church for almost seven years as an assistant pastor, youth pastor, uh, preaching, singing, leading, singing, and uh, helping out in choir and all that kind of stuff. Got to do stuff at the Pacific Garden Mission in downtown Chicago and worked there and, and enjoyed my years there. And then in, in 2010, I went to work for Brother Walt Shepherd, who you've heard preach. Uh, there in, and he's in, from Finlay, Ohio, and uh, was an assistant pastor there for 10 years under Brother Walt Shepard. Great, great time. He's an older brother. He has a younger brother in the ministry. I'm a younger brother, have an older brother in the ministry. And so we really worked together well and enjoyed it. I was about an hour south of Toledo, Ohio, and that's where my brother is. Uh, I think Pastor Owens has mentioned Brother Rick Sal, and uh, I don't think Brother Sal has been here before. I think he was over at Corona. But uh, Brother Sal is my father-in-law, and he pastored Hope Baptist Church in Toledo, Ohio for 40 years. Just right about the time my wife was born, they started Hope Baptist Church. And a couple years ago, he retired, and my brother took over Hope Baptist Church as the senior pastor. And uh, so it's a great fellowship we've had there. My brother and I married sisters. So the only two Sal girls married the only two Marshall boys. And uh, it's all in the family, okay? <laughs> And we're related and interrelated. So our, our, our kids are double first cousins. And I believe that's illegal in some countries. But uh, very, close, <laughs> very closely related, and uh, it, it's just a blessing. Um, I, I, I say, to, to whom much is given, much is required. And I've been given a lot. I've been given a lot of spiritual history and been able to be in church. Sometimes I think I've been in church way too much, but I probably haven't been in enough. But uh, thank God for it. Uh, many, many uh, church services, and I just thank the Lord anytime He can speak to me through His Word, yeah. and that He hasn't given up. Yeah. One of my Bible, favorite Bible verses, I have many, but this is one, uh, one. My life's verse since I was a kid was uh, strangely, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are 75 verses in Luke chapter 2. Did you know that? Luke chapter 2, verse 75 says, In holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of thy life. And it's a, a verse referencing uh, the birth of, of, of John the Baptist and, and, and him being uh, separated from the Lord, but it's a verse that I have claimed for myself. Uh, also, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 is a, one of my life's verses, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I thank God he never gives up on the clay. Amen? Amen. And he makes it again and does something with it. Uh, I, I, I could tell you more. Uh, my wife says, you know, trying to explain your life, Matt, it's pretty interesting. Hey, people don't quite understand it. One day, Matt, I might show you a picture of some of the vehicles that we grew up in. And, uh, you know, if you, okay, here, here's what I tell people. If you don't understand me, it's one word. 
asphyxiation. That's what it is. I smelled a lot of diesel smoke as a kid on the bus. Amen. And it, it, it kind of messed with my mind a little bit, Brother Owens. And so uh, I grew up as a little munchkin. I got pictures of five years old helping my dad change the oil on these buses, right? And that, we're talking five and a half gallons of oil or more. Um, you know, 118 gallons of fuel, of diesel fuel. And I, I wanted to be with my dad. And I was just a little munchkin just up inside the engine trying to do stuff. And uh, just crazy but exciting life the Lord has given us. And I thank the Lord for it. In the last few years, the Lord has done a work in my heart. I think Pastor Shepard uh, mentioned um, some of the things that God did there at Cornerstone Baptist Church. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, you had a uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening lunch service out somewhere at a park when he was here. Is that right? Yeah. All right. And um, he told me he covered a little bit of something called the mandates uh, for discipleship. Yep. All right. I'm going to ask you to speak out loud if this was... There's about five. Did he cover the mandate that fruit should remain? Yeah. That your fruit should remain? All right. How many did he do? How many mandates? Do you remember? Did he cover uh, uh, the John 17 and the work that Christ finished? No? Okay. All right. I won't go into those. I just want to kind of see where he went. So I'm not going to overlap what he did. And the reason why I'm doing this tonight is because this is a work that the Lord has done in my, my life, my wife's life, my son's, and uh, Pastor Shepard referenced it. it. It is something that the Lord, it, it's here. It's been here all along. In fact, turn to Matthew chapter 28, would you please? It, it's here. It's why we're here, by the way. It's why the church is here. It's why believers are still on this earth. It's been here a lot, but I think... Christians and churches over, overall, and I'm talking Bible-believing churches, have forgotten part of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, there's this Great Commission Christ gives. He gives it to His apostles and gave it to us as well. In verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. A biblical church is involved in the Great Commission. And they're not just involved in part of the Great Commission, because it is all one commission. So notice the command to go. Go ye, therefore. A church is not to just support missionaries. They are to be missionaries themselves. Yeah. Let me say that one more time. A church is not just to support missionaries. High thing. A high thing. An important thing to do. To give to worldwide missions. Amen. Amen. But our giving to worldwide missions does not get us off the hook to be a missionary. Go ye into all the world. Go ye. Right? And there's that Bible King James word ye that refers to you all, as they say in the South. Okay? It's you all. It's every one of you in this room. And it's not just the disciples. It's us this day. By the way, if they hadn't obeyed this, we wouldn't be talking about it. If they hadn't obeyed this great commission, we would not be talking about it tonight. So we sit here tonight with the same commission. Though notice, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So salvation, baptism. Now, the next one uh, is often not it's not quite emphasized in most churches. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That last part, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, often is left out or left off of what most churches do. I want to commend Central Baptist Church for the incredible job I've, I've heard and I've seen in reaching out into this lost world. What a blessing. You know how many churches are not doing that? I can tell you, many. Many churches are content to have a building. Many churches are content to have people come into that building. But that is not the end of the commission. It's to see people saved. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. 
And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He is actively, the Bible tells us in John 3, Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it's come from where it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So the Spirit is moving. He's still moving. The wind bloweth where it listeth. He is still moving, and he wants people to be born again. Amen. That's why we're here. We're here to bring glory to God, and we're here to bring others to bring glory to God. So teaching them to observe all things is that last part. Now, some people, they're excited to get someone saved, and that's good. But that's only one part. Seeing them baptized is a part of that great commission. That should be a desire of the local church, to follow like Christ did in baptism, and to baptize, it's a sign of identity. It doesn't get you saved. It's just a picture. It's a picture of the spiritual baptism. And so that is also part of the Great Commission. But teaching them to observe all things is that other part. That's teaching them to follow the Lord in faithfulness, to come to church. I think that would be part of it, wouldn't it? But also to give. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's one of the things he taught. So we would observe the things that he taught. And, and more and more, we could, we could build into that, but can we, can we wrap that up into one word, and that would be discipleship. Being a disciplined one. So teaching them to observe. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. Not just to look at it, but to follow it. Now, there's one more point, I think, that, the Lord, that is, is it's just indicative. It's just built in into this. And that is, you have salvation, you have baptism, you have discipleship, and you have one more. And this is the last one that wraps it up. I call it multiplication. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Four generations of believers in that verse. Multiplication, handing it down to someone else. Salvation, baptism, discipleship, multiplication. And in that multiplication, that spiritual maturity, that's bringing people to the understanding of the Word of God enough that they could teach someone else the Word of God so that person could understand the Word of God enough to teach someone else, and it moves on. Now, those four tenets, I believe, are the main purpose of the church. This is the main reason and I'm, that we're here. And I believe all four of those need to be involved and be going at the same time. Amen. Salvation, baptism, discipleship, multiplication. That discipleship is teaching them to deserve all things which I have commanded you. But Paul said, the same thing commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So multiplying them. There should be a place in your Christian life at some point where somebody could walk up to you and say, hey, could you take this Bible and lead somebody else to Christ? You should be saying, absolutely, I can do that. That would be the goal. Now, I can also take the Word of God and apply it to different areas in their life. All right, we're having marriage problems. Okay, let me show you this. A mature believer should be able to do that. Are you, are you following me? All right. The next level, that last level, is then I, by God's grace, teach someone else how to do what I do. And that's multiplication. Now, I lay that down because that's kind of the whole concept of what Pastor Shepard was preaching. But I'm going to back us out, and I'm going to give you a reason to be involved in this great commission. Now, it's going to get a little bit weird. You ready? You okay for weird tonight? You, are you okay for a little bit deep? I know it's a little warm in here tonight. If you need to take off a jacket and get cooler, that's fine. We're going to go just going to dive a little bit deep. Turn, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to talk about the big picture tonight. We're going to talk about the big picture. Why I should be involved in this great commission. And I told you we're going to, I want you to, I want you to get a, a big tank of oxygen, okay? Put on the scuba, do, scuba diving thing, put that, that, that hose in there, okay? And start breathing, because we're going deep. All right, I want to see bubbles. Anybody, 
You got bubbles? Okay, your take's on. You're good to go? Everybody ready to go? Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, for some of you, uh, this is something that you might have heard already, but there's a point to it. Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to talk to you tonight about the establishment of the sons of God. The establishment of the sons of God. Now, Ezekiel chapter 28, if you would, in verse number 12. What we're getting ready to find out here is what, what, what theologians, theologians would call the, the origin of Satan. Where Satan came from. And we're, it, it, it'll get good. It might get a little deep, but it's going to get good at the end. So how many promise me with your hand? I will, I'm just, I will hold on to the end, okay? I will hold on to the end. All right, Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Verse 11, more of the Lord, the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Now, before we read on, know this, and I won't have time to build a big platform on this, but know, know this, the Old Testament prophets would prophesy often of things that were going to happen immediately. Okay? Events that were getting ready to happen to their nation or to a nation that's in captivity, their nation in captivity, or even other nations. And they would prophesy about those things. Now, sometimes they were prophesying about something that would happen in the near future. Something in the immediate future or something in the near future. And sometimes they prophesied about things that were happening in the far away future. Sometimes they would prophesy about things that seems to hit all of those times. Okay? So, there's a thing called the mountain peaks of prophecy. And a prophet would stand here and he might not be able to see all the way over the far mountain away. But as he prophesied, his prophecy would hit all of the mountains. The foothills, the mountains, and the high peaks. He didn't always know who he was talking to, who he was referencing, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God and holy men, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And here's a prophecy that's given concerning a king named Tyrus. Now, all of a sudden in that prophecy about a king named Tyrus comes in another character. He's speaking to Tyrus, but he begins to speak to someone else. I want you to see it. It's verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Hmm. Eden. We know about that in Genesis. We know that in Genesis there is a, a cherubim that's been placed there with flaming sword that is to guard it all the way around, and no one knows where that is, but we know who was there before. Adam and Eve. All of a sudden, the king of Tyrus has a prophecy concerning himself about Eden. Thou hast been in Eden. Well, not any king hasn't. Not any human king. Who is it? He says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and jasper, sapphire, all these precious metals, uh, precious stones, the emerald and carbuncle and the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity is found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. In the middle of this prophecy to the king of Tyre shows up a character, a being. He's called a son of God. He was a son of God. His name is Lucifer. His name was Lucifer, is now Satan. There is a prophecy concerning Satan 
in the middle of this other prophecy. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. You have read this passage if you're a Bible student, but notice what it says. Isaiah chapter 14. There's a character here that was in the Garden of Eden. Can I ask you, according to the Word of God in Genesis, who are the three individuals we know were in the Garden of Eden? Let's, get, let's go with four, be specific. Four individuals in the Garden of Eden. God, Adam, and the serpent. The Bible never references Adam and Eve having any of these physical characteristics that are mentioned in Ezekiel 28. Having, uh, they, they weren't called anointed cherub, the, all these coverings, these precious stones covering them. It doesn't reference God. God's prophesying. Amen. There's only one individual this can re be referencing in the Garden of Eden, and we believe it is Lucifer. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll see kind of a cross-reference here of this being. In verse number 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars. Notice that phrase, stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Notice this phrase, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms. Here we find the origin of Satan. His, he was, his name was Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer. He was in part of the angelic host of God, anointed cherub. If you're taking notes, I want you to see, we're going to do a, a simple outline this evening. I'm going to wrap it up here in just a few minutes and give us kind of an overview of why we're involved in these four things. Number one, we're talking about Lucifer, and we're talking about the sons of God as well. You see, Lucifer was a special creation of God. Go back, if you would, to Ezekiel 28. Let's look at his special creative uh, being, or the creative being he was. Notice in Ezekiel 28, it says this, Thou hast been an Eden, the guard of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Look at verse uh, 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum. If you're taking notes, write this down. He was complete. He was complete. He was beautiful. Notice this next phrase. Full of wisdom. He was a very wise being. And he hasn't lost all of that wisdom. The Bible calls it earthly, sensual, devilish. He still has some of that wisdom. Isn't that interesting? He was perfect in beauty, it says. He was attractive and attractive to others. He was a being that was beautiful to look on. The Bible says he was an anointed cherub. He was commissioned by God. Please listen now. Satan, before he was Satan, as Lucifer, was commissioned by God for a special purpose. It seems, as we compare Scripture, that Satan led some sort of worship around the throne of God. Especially when we compare, in Revelation, the other four cherubs that worship God night and day, saying, holy, holy, holy. Satan was involved with that. His name means light bearer, and you can see why he would be considered a light bearer. With all of those precious stones, the Bible says we're covering him. Now you say, this is a weird thing. Well, have you ever read Revelation? There are some very interesting characters in the book of Revelation, isn't it? There's, it's, it, it? It's a weird book, is it not? And so it's not hard for us to understand this or comprehend it in that it does, he did exist. He was commissioned. Now, go over to Job. We're doing a Bible study. You still have your scuba diving gear on? You're still breathing? Okay. Doing a little Bible study for tonight. Sometimes you have to go deep in order to understand why. 
Job, if you would, in chapter 38. Remember, in, in Ezekiel, it talks about those stars of God. Stars of God. He was considered one. Notice, in, Ezekiel, in Job, excuse me, chapter 38, the oldest book in the Bible, by the way, it says in Job 38 and verse 4, Where was thou? God is, is rebuking Job here. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. So what's God saying to Job? He said, there's been a lot of talking going on here <laughs> throughout the book of Job. I'm going to talk now. And when God talks, um, he has a lot of questions. Especially these, three, these, cha these chapters right here at the end. A lot of questions. And he asked Job to start off with, um, who is he that darkeneth counsel by words, with, words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the what? God's referencing creation. When the worlds were found, formed. Job, were you there? No. It's rhetorical. No. You were not there. Verse 7. This creation days, these days, when the morning stars sang together, and notice this, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Lucifer was a son of God. You follow me? He's one of the sons of God. He's not the only begotten son of God. That would be Jesus. He's not even related to Jesus. Lucifer is a created being. He's a, he was a cherub. But he was called the son of God. He had a special role, a special commission. And we learn from his design, it seems, that he had musical instruments built into his very body. The noise of thy tabrets and thy vials. He was a musical being, which makes sense if he was going to worship around the throne. So he had a special design, he had a leading role. Listen now, with all those precious stones, when you consider that God is light and Him is no darkness at all, <coughs> that His very body would reflect light. With all those precious stones, right? So he was, can I say it this way? He would have been a mesmerizing being. Just dazzling with all those precious stones. He led, I believe, that angelic host called the sons of God. Stars of God sang together, sons of God sang together. They worshiped, they honored, they praised, and they said, God's worthy. But that wasn't enough for Satan. Lucifer became jealous, became envious of the position of God. And he said, I will be like the Most High. And he tried to take God's throne. This did not work. This never worked. This will never work. But Satan is a sore loser, and he hasn't learned the lesson yet. And yet he fights against God to this day. And we can study in Genesis chapter 6. We can study in Job chapter 1, verse 6, and Job 2. We can study in Job 38. We could reference Revelation 12, 4, with the stars and the tail of the dragon, all of that. What is that pointing to? Psalm 82. It's pointing to the fact that when Satan fell, he led many of the sons of God, an angelic host, to go with him. Now that's an important point. Satan was created as a son of God, a cherub, anointed cherub, but one of the sons of God, to worship God. Created to reflect God's glory. Created to say, holy, holy, holy is God. But he fell through pride and envy. And thought to think that all the glory should go to him. Listen, Satan had a counterfeit plan. His counterfeit plan became a self-exaltation plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mountain of the congregation. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. But the results of Satan and Lucifer's fall was this. 
He lost his position. He still, by the way, possesses more power than any other created being. He is the God of this world. Jude chapter 1 tells us. I'll read that for t quickly. If you want to turn over there with me, that would be wonderful. Jude chapter 1. And since there's only one chapter, we'll look at verse 4. Jude 1, 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He has power, Satan has power, to lead these ungodly men, sons of God, and they are reserved in chains of darkness waiting for the judgment day, those angels that he took with him. Now, why is that important? Because he also lost his throne on earth. Satan lost his throne. On earth. By the way, he's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. But he has lost his throne on this earth. He lost his name. He used to be called light bearer, Lucifer. Now he's Satan, adversary. He still, by the way, though, can transform himself into an angel of light. In fact, even a preacher. Paul talks about ministers of Satan. He's able to get into religious circles and have sway. He's a chameleon. So he still is working in this earth. Now, we're coming up out of the water a little bit. That was the first dive. And there's so much more we could talk about with that, but I wanted to see this first of all. Lucifer and the sons of God. Why? He, he was a special creation of God. He had a commission, and he had a counterfeit plan. Now, there's another son. His name is Adam. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Another son of God. His name is Adam. Genesis chapter 1, if you would, in verse number 26. God, the Godhead speaking here says, And God said, Let us make man in our own image, in our image, excuse me, after our likeness, and let them, man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Adam is the next son of God. You ready? Adam, turn to chapter 2. Chapter 2, Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He is called the Son of God, Adam is. A title that he shares, by the way, exclusively with God's own perfect Son, Jesus Christ. The Son of God. Uh, Text, Luke 3, Luke 3, 38. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam is referenced as the son of God. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians. We're, we're, we're coming up out of the water here in just a minute. And hopefully when we do, when we, when we, uh, we've been submerging, when we emerge, it's going to hit you. It's going to hit you while you're on this planet. You ready? 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 15, if you would. We've talked about Lucifer and the sons of God, that he was a special creation, that he had a commission that he failed in, that, Lucifer, that he also had a counterfeit plan, and that plan was self-promotion, self-exaltation. We're talking now about the son of God, Adam. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says in verse 45, and so it was written, it is written, the first man, Adam, we just read it, that was, that was in Genesis, it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a, Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. 
The first man, first man is of the earth, earthy. That's Adam. That's us in Adam, by the way. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, Adam was made in God's image as a tripart being, body, soul, and spirit. Adam, the son of God, walked with God in the garden and had unbroken fellowship with him. Adam, oh, you, you got to turn. Are you okay turning? Yeah. All right, Genesis 1. Go back. Sorry. If you have one of those big Bibles, it's like, it's like turning a whole library when you flip back from 1 Corinthians to Genesis 1. But notice Genesis 1. <coughs> Genesis 1. Adam also had a special commission from God. Genesis 1.28 says this. And God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and what? Whoa, wait a minute. We just talked about that one, didn't we? Yeah. That, hold that word. He said, Multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, God's talking spiritually, or physically here. We know that. Have children. Replenish this earth. And he says, And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Adam had a special commission like Lucifer had a special commission. Lucifer was one of the sons of God. Adam is the son of God, according to Luke. And his commission was to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But he could not fulfill that mission alone. And so God made him help me. That was Eve. And through intimacy with his bride, the seed of Adam would produce sons and daughters of God. Daughters will be multiplied in my image. That was his goal. If I had a water, I could take, I'm going to cough really. <coughs> There's um, sons and daughters of God. They in turn would reproduce and they would populate the entire planet with the sons and daughters, daughters of God. And those sons and daughters of God would bring honor and glory and love and worship. So to speak, they would do what Lucifer he has a plan for God's son named Adam. And he comes into the garden. I won't read it, but in, first, in, in Genesis 3, 1 through 6, we see the serpent who is more subtle than any beast of the field comes here and tempts Eve. His agenda was to pervert this new man and this new plan of God. That's why he came. And he was, going to try, he was going to cause the complete image of God to be lost in Adam. He wanted to destroy Adam's fellowship with God. And he wanted to stop God's plan of reproducing sons and daughters of God in the earth. Now, please listen to that statement I just made. That's a very important statement. Satan, one of his plans in tempting Eve and Adam and causing them to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good, did it? He replaced God's word with the prideful ideas, ideals and the concepts of himself. The same thing that, there must be more to this than God is telling you. He's a liar and deceiver, and he appealed to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Now, you know what the results were? Adam died spiritually. Eve died spiritually. And they lost, please listen now, we're, we're coming up out of the water. They lost the complete image of God. And because of that, Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered in the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. They passed down that fallen... Genesis 5.3, And Adam lived... 130 years and begat a son, read it for me with, with me, would you please? In his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Do you see it? They lost the image of God. And now man would be born in man's image. Satan won. Satan won. Now, we know Genesis 3.15. God began a plan. But on that day, Satan won. 
and God had to judge that animal and cover that man and woman in their nakedness because they lost the image. Now, anyone who is born and sins is made after the image of Satan. Fallen, broken image. Now, we look like our father, the devil. Do you see his plan? Do you see his counterfeit plan? It ruined the image. Multiplication, reproducing, replenishing process. He got it. Or so he thought. Last point. We have Lucifer and the sons of God. Lucifer was a son of God, and he was a special creation and a special commission. But through his counterfeit plan of pride and envy, he was kicked out of heaven. Some people say he landed in the church choir. I don't know. We have Adam, the son of God, who was a special creation of God, and he has special commission from God to bring glory to God before the fall. But he lost his ability to reproduce after God's image. How? Through Satan's counterfeit plan. Oh, but here we come out, out of the water. I want you to see number three, the last one, and that is the last Adam. Amen. And the sons of God. Amen. Go to that God would send the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. There was a promise in the middle of tragedy. By the way, God always does this. In the middle of tragedy... He gives truth. In the middle of verse number 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that, which, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. That's Adam, earthly Adam. And afterward, that which is spiritual. That's the second Adam. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Amen. John 1, 14 says, But as many as received him, to them give you power to even to become the sons of God. Jesus Christ is that last. Oh, and boy, was he a special creation of God. Born like a man, as a man, in a woman's womb. Born of the Spirit. He was brought here as the express image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, Colossians 1.15, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ is the express image of God. He spiritually becomes a special creation of God. Amen. They become a son of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become oh boy even to them that go to church even to them that say the rosary no no even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit marvel not that I said unto you ye must be born again John said it this way, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Amen. The last Adam named Jesus Christ had a commission. Satan had a commission and he failed in it. Adam had a commission and he failed in it. But the last Adam had a commission. And he never fails. Amen. You know what his commission was? To destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. To destroy the works of the devil. And to restore, please listen now, to restore the lost image of God in the sons of God. First, first John, you ready? First John 3. I keep telling you we're almost done, but we really are almost done. First John chapter 3. Thank you, you're listening so well.
1 John 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. There's that reference of his fall. For this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was manifested. That's when he came incarnate in this world. That he might what? Hmm. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. First John tells us that, verse, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and yet appear, but we shall be, we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The purpose and commission of Christ was to destroy the work of the devil and to restore the lost image. And that full manifestation of a son of God takes place when a believer is glorified one day, though they are a son of God now. That full manifestation of the sons of God. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, a Christian is also begotten of God, and he bears the express image of God as Christ did. And through spiritual intimacy with Christ, the Christian takes that seed, the word of God, and they brought them new life, born of uncorruptible seed, right, incorruptible. He reproduces sons of God on this earth, spiritually. Okay? And those sons of God bring love and honor and praise and glory to God, to worship God. Here is the whole plan. When I got saved, I became a son of God. Amen. And I was given the word of God Amen. to take out into this world and say, you can become a son of God. The image that was lost in Adam can be restored by Jesus Christ. Amen. And you can bring glory to God now. Whereas before I brought glory to Satan, my father. Now I can bring glory to my father, Jehovah. Amen. How? By being born again. By being made a son of God. You see, this thing is bigger than just giving someone a track. That's important. It's what God does with the Word of God in someone's life. He changes them completely, but He makes them in the Son of God. Here, compare these two. Lucifer and the sons of God through Jesus Christ. By the way, if any man be in Christ, he is a... All things are... And behold, all things are become new. Satan was a special creation of God, Ezekiel 28. But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says... I'm a new, unique creature in Jesus Christ. Compare Satan who sealest up the sum before his fall. But Colossians tells us two, Colossians 2.10 says, I am complete in him. Satan was full of wisdom, but the Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that I have the mind of Christ. He was perfect in beauty, but the Bible says God beautifies the meek through salvation. That's Psalm 149, verse 4. He was anointed of God. First John tells us we have anointing of God. First John 2, 27. Satan was designed to show forth the glory of God. We are designed to show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Satan was designed to lead the sons of God to worship God, but he lost that opportunity. But you and I are designed to lead others to worship God. Psalm 40, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord together with me, and let us exalt his name together. Satan, his name means light bearer, but now he is an adversary. We have the light of God dwelling inside of us, and we are to let that light shine. Do you not understand with me tonight? The reason why Satan stops you from witnessing is because you're making more people look like what he used to look like. And he's jealous. And he wants the sons for himself. Pastor Shepard preached a message one time called Get the Kids Out of the House. He said, if you live across the street or across next to a house where you knew there were kids in that home that were being abused. There was no denying it. You knew it. He said, how many of you would stop at nothing to get those kids out of that house? You would do your best to try to get them out. 
and you would tell them about the life that you have to give them, a life they could live, and you would stop by their house, and you would knock on their door and say, hey, there is so much better for you over here. You can't force those kids out of the house. They have to willingly come. What is that? That's Satan's home. He is an accuser. He is an abuser. He is a wicked being. But he wants the sons. He wants the kids for himself. You and I have been called to go out in this world, Brother Owens, and get the kids out of Satan's house into God's house. When you're knocking doors, when you're preaching, when you're giving tracts, it is a huge galactic battle going on over who gets the sons. And when I'm a part of giving the gospel and they by faith turn to God, God gets more glory. And Satan loses glory. Why am I on this planet? To bring glory to my Father as a son of God. That's exactly what Jesus said when he was on this earth. I do the works of my Father. I bring glory to my Father. My Father. My Father. Over and over again, he talked about the relationship with his Father. You know what you and I are here for? To bring glory to our Father. But we don't stop there. And I feel like a lot of Christians never get into this battle. Because they're not trying to get the kids out of Satan's home. He leaves them alone. As soon as they start to try to get some of those kids out of that abusive home, that sinful home where Satan, their father, is keeping them under lock and key, that's when Satan gets involved. Oh, no, you're not getting the kids. They're my kids. But God wants to change them and make them a son. You know what Satan's counterfeit plan is with the last Adam and his sons? is to keep lost, lost. To blind their minds, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine to them. And he wants to keep believers distracted from their relationship with Jesus Christ, resulting, please listen, this is the last point, it's, it's very poignant. He wants to keep us distracted, resulting in no spiritual reproduction. He doesn't want any more sons. Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine to them. The God of this world blinds their minds. We're not just trying to overcome our, our weakness to pass out of track. That's, that may be the human side. There's a spiritual side, and that is Satan is trying to blind people's minds. I got a question for you. Do you want to be a part of those four things? Salvation, baptism, discipleship, and then multiplication more sons to God. It's a huge galactic plan, but there is a potential in every human, brain, every human being to be made in the Son of God. That's why Jesus came. I want to be a part of that, and the Lord has blessed it, and I still am excited about seeing more sons brought, bring glory to our Father. It's a big plan. I hope you want to be a part of yourself. Father, I know this was a little deeper tonight, but it is what is going on. There is a battle over the souls of men. And so to speak, it's a battle over who gets the sons. Will there be more sons to bring glory to Satan in this next life or more sons to bring glory to God? Lord, our job is to tell people about our Father, like you did, so that glory may be brought to you. And help us, Lord. Teach us how to. As you said to your disciples in John 17, I, I have given the words to the men that thou gavest me. And they, they have believed and know and are sure that I came from thee. Lord, help us to do the same. And you said there in that passage, as I, have, as I was sent in the world, so send I them. I send these men out the same way I came, to give the words. Help us to see more sons brought to you, more salvation, more baptism, more discipleship, and more multiplication, Lord. We pray to this end. With their heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand this evening if we would. We're going to sing number 663, Make Me a Blessing. Maybe you'd like to come and say, 
Lord, help me see the big plan to get the gospel out that sons may bring glory to you. Help me be a part of that. May you come and dedicate yourself tonight. 663, make me a blessing. to do and so as soon as we go out we have to tell others about the gospel and get them saved get them baptized get them in get them discipled so praise the lord for that brother that was a good message tonight let's pray and then we'll be dismissed father tonight thank you for your word lord we thank you for what we've heard and what we've learned and lord i pray that we might not just be hearers of the word but lord i pray that we might be doers of the word and put to practice the things that we've learned tonight Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the day. Lord, we pray that you might dismiss us with your blessings. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stay after and uh, fellowship with Brother Marshall if you have any questions. And uh, we'll see you Thursday night.